with a stunning no-hitter, September 4th, 1993. Welcome to MLB Network's Studio 42 with Bob Costas. How do you properly introduce tonight's guest? To say that Ernie Harwell is one of baseball's Hall of Fame voices is true, but it's also insufficient. Yes, he was among the first inductees into Cooperstown's broadcast wing, but talent and craftsmanship were only part of Harwell's deep and enduring appeal. He called big league games for more than half a century, most of it with the Detroit Tigers, the team he joined in 1960, and with one brief interruption stayed with through 2002. He was 85 when he called his last Tiger game, his voice and presence still pretty much as vibrant as the day he broke in. Over all that time, Harwell's warmth, accessibility, and genuine demeanor allowed him to forge an extraordinary connection with his listeners. He wasn't so much acclaimed as he was appreciated, not so much lauded as loved. Now, two months shy of his 92nd birthday, Harwell is still sharp, still looks and sounds great. But he and we now know this. Appearances notwithstanding, Ernie Harwell won't be with us much longer. He's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He and Lulu, his wife of 68 years, have accepted that he likely has only months to live. But even as his remarkable life nears its end, Harwell's abiding decency and good-naturedness shine through, as does his love for the game he has graced with his presence. The Yankee pitcher Lefty Gomez once said, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, I know that I'm a lot luckier than I'm good. I've been lucky to broadcast some great events and to broadcast the exploits of some great players. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the corner, the great uh, Michigan and Trumbull, the most famous corner in the Midwest. He struck him out, and Morris has a no-hitter. And McLean has his 30th victory of the 1968 season. There's a long drive to right, and it is a home run for Gibson. And the Titans have won their first minute since 1945. Let's listen to the memo here at Tiger Stadium. The pitch, he swings, and there's a fly ball to left. Here comes Herndon. He's there. He's got it. The Tigers are the champions of 1984. Tonight we say goodbye, but we will not forget. Moments like this shall live on forever. Ernie, before we review your remarkable life and career, let's get to the most present thing. Um, you've accepted the fact that you have terminal cancer, and we're recording this in the middle of the World Series. In your mind, is this the last World Series you're likely to see? This will be my last World Series, I think. Uh, the uh, doctors uh, gave me about six months to live, give or take a few months. And that was back in July, so I'm hoping to reach my uh, birthday on January 25th, but I'm I'm pretty sure I won't uh, make the baseball season, but you never know. The Lord works wonders, and we'll just uh, wait and uh, see what happens. Two things that defy, at least two, that defy what people might expect. First of all, in January, you'll be 92. You're remarkably fit and vital and look remarkably well for a man of 92. But on top of it, as you've just acknowledged, you have terminal cancer. You don't look as I sit across from you here, you don't look like a dying man. Well, God's been good to me. He gave me good health, and I've tried to keep healthy. And uh, George uh, Romney, the former governor of uh, Michigan, had a great saying, I want to die healthy. And it looks like I'm going to die pretty healthy. Of course, the final days will be a little more stressed, I know, and full of pain and things like that. But uh, I'm ready for that, too. But I was very lucky. I, I kept myself in good shape. I missed only uh, two ball games in my 55 years, and uh, neither one of those was because of health. So I've just been uh, blessed with good health. I know you're a person of honest and deep faith. 
I guess that's what's sustaining you now because you don't appear to be overwhelmed by the circumstances you face. No, I'm not overwhelmed by the circumstances. When the doctors came out and talked to me and the family, they, they said that this was um, something that couldn't uh, be cured. It was terminal. And uh, one of the doctors said, if you were my, if you were my father, I would say just uh, don't do anything, just relax and, and wait for the inevitable. But I had a great peace about that and a, and a great closure to it. And I knew that God was in charge and that, that whatever happens, happens for the best. So I really have a lot of serenity and my great support from my wife, Lulu, and the family and all my friends. So it's uh, been so far a fairly easy task to accept it. Is there anything that remains to give you closure? Anything you feel you need to do between now and and the time that you leave us? No, I just want to take good care of my wife and, and the family and uh, try to uh, let them uh, uh, be at peace uh, as I go through this process. And, but I feel very good. I feel a sense of comfort because I know that God's in charge. Publicly, you had what appeared to be your moment of closure when you addressed the crowd at Comerica Park. I do want to express my feelings here. It's a wonderful night for me. I really feel lucky to be here. And I want to thank you for that warm welcome. That was a great event for me. The uh, Tigers uh, asked me to come down and uh, say farewell. And uh, first of all, uh, they asked me to address the team, which was a, a real honor for me. And Jim Leland was there. He had the old, whole team uh, uh, gathered around. and. I addressed them, and then I went up and talked to the press. And then in the, after a couple of innings of the game between Kansas City and the Tigers, uh, they sent me out there to the microphone, and I said a few words of farewell. And it was uh, very heartwarming to me to, to see the way f people uh, felt about me. In my almost 92 years on this earth, the good Lord, has blessed me with a great journey. And the blessed part of that journey is that it's going to end here in the great state of Michigan. I have always been tremendously impressed by your vitality, as I mentioned, even now at, at this stage, approaching 92 and, and with a serious illness. But when you did your last broadcast, when you were 85 years old in 2002, <laughs> and I think of myself as a student of this, I could scarcely hear any difference between that Ernie Harwell and the Ernie Harwell I first remember hearing in the 1960s. And here to begin the play-by-play -play of his final game as a Tiger broadcaster is Ernie Harwell. Thank you, Paul Carey, and uh, hi again, everybody. It's been a uh, wonderful association. Well, I guess the, the old voice didn't change a whole lot, and uh, as I say, I think it was mainly uh, the genes and, and the good health that the Lord gave me and the fact that I enjoyed the job so much I think I never looked on it as work it was something that I got a great pleasure out of being with the people in baseball getting to know them and traveling with them and being a part of that uh, great fraternity that is the Major League Baseball scene you've had a remarkable relationship with fans across the country but especially throughout Tiger territory, and I would imagine now that the letters and the calls and the attempts to reach out and express what you've meant to people uh, are just too many. They're, it's just so overwhelming. You can't respond to them all. No, I wish I could. That would be uh, nice if I could sit down and, and write a letter to each person because the, it's been overwhelming. The, I think we've gotten about seven, 8,000 letters. And, uh, and people so don't write letters as much as they no, used they to. Don't. They and send emails and texts. And I've, I've got the prayer shawls and icons and all kind of things and uh, Catholic mass cards. And people have been so supportive and so loving that uh, I, I, I just I can't understand it. But it's there, I guess. And I think a lot of it is uh, the fact that I've been around a little while and, and, and every announcer is a conduit between of the ball club and the public. Once you settle into a region for four or five years, and whether you're good or bad, you know they get used to you. And I certainly want to thank you from the depth of my heart for your devotion, 
your support, your loyalty, and your love. Thank you very much, and God bless you. The plays of the year. The unbelievable has happened. Next Monday, watch the top slides, drives, and dives from the NL. Oh, what a play. Then next Tuesday, it's the AL's top smashes, crashes, and bashes. It's gone. Capital One Premier Plays of the Year. Next Monday and Tuesday night at nine, only on MLB Network. Gentlemen, this is vodka. There was a time when standing for something stood for something. When men refused to drink whatever the world just happened to pour in their glass. There was a time when men were men. It was last night. Inspired by 300 years of tradition. Kettle One. Please drink responsibly. The New York Yankees are World Series champions. Celebrate with Sports Illustrated's exclusive championship package featuring the official World Series DVD from MLB Productions, World Series Champions. Plus, get this special hardcover commemorative book capturing the Yankees' fantastic season and postseason run with SI's unparalleled writing and photography. Go online to SIOffer.com or call now to get both with a paid subscription. 56 issues for only $1.59 an issue. Save 68% off the cover price. Plus, use your credit card, and you'll also get this officially licensed championship baseball. Featuring the World Series trophy and team logo, it was designed exclusively for SI to honor the world champions. Relive all the thrills of the star-studded Yankees championship season. Go to SIOffer.com or call now to get the official DVD, the commemorative book, and the championship baseball. This limited championship package is only available from Sports Illustrated. Call or go online now. Welcome back to MLB Network's Studio 42 with Bob Costas. We know that, especially in baseball, because of the pace of the game and the fact that it's day in, day out, the local baseball announcer, if he's any good at all and if he's been around any period of time, has a special relationship with his audience that no network announcer and probably no announcer in another sport, no matter how good he may be, can exactly duplicate. There's something special about that relationship between the local baseball announcer and his audience. But in your case, it seemed to go beyond what it might have been in other cities. What do you think the reason for that is? I don't think there's any uh, reason for all this um, uh, response, except that uh, I was the Tiger announcer, and uh, I showed up and uh, did the best I could, and I tried to be myself, and. My whole philosophy was the game is the main thing, and uh, don't e ever interfere with the game because people tune in to hear what the Tigers are doing, what the score is, and uh, no matter who's doing the game, they're going to tune in. So you, you have to realize that when you do it. And I think the uh, regional or local announcer really has a great responsibility because people take him to the beaches and, and the picnics and wherever they go. and he becomes part of the family. Now the Tigers ready to take the field and the birds are coming to bat. It, it's a great job for people and you're very lucky when you get that job. I remember Jack Buck saying that to me when I was a wet behind the ears kid coming to KMOX in St. Louis and Jack was a national figure doing baseball and football both but he was at his most iconic in St. Louis, mm -hmm. where when he passed away in 2002, it was almost as if a head of state had died, and, and people had much the same feeling about him in that area as people in, in Michigan do about you. And he, he said to me early on, no matter how fortunate you may be, keep this base in St. Louis. People will never feel nationally about you the way they feel in a local community. Now, of course, I was never the voice of the Cardinals, so it mm -hmm. never got to that, to that extent, but no. you know what Jack was talking about. Absolutely. I think it's sort of being like uh, in a comfort zone when you have the job of being the announcer for your local team. You're there all the time, day to day, and they have to listen to you whether they want to <laughs> or not. 
vanishing breed. Not that there aren't some very, very good younger local baseball announcers, but the circumstances have changed. More games on television, people move around more than they used to, loyalties may be divided. So it seems that even if you took a supremely talented 30-year-old announcer now, he or she could not duplicate what Red Barber or Mel Allen or Bob Prince or Vin Scully still going strong in LA or, or Jack Buck or yourself, and I'm leaving many other worthy people out. It, the circumstances just won't allow for it anymore, will they? I think the circumstances are such now that a young man breaking in would have a really tough time to establish himself like the old timers did. I know when I went to Brooklyn in 1948, there were 16 teams in the two major leagues and each team had maybe two or one announcer. You, you, you had less than, than the, uh, you know, 15 or 16 announcers. Now you've got, what, 30, 32 teams, and they all have uh, six announcers, and uh, then uh, you have uh, network games coming in all the time, and super stations, X radio, internet. super stations, and people just don't they get to zero in on one person. I was lucky to be a part of those, that group that uh, had the only game in town, so to speak. And they had to listen to you whether they wanted to or not. And that intense and personal local identification uh, defies logic sometimes. You yourself have said, for example, that all things considered, and many people share this opinion, Vin Scully is the greatest of all baseball announcers. And yet if in 1970 they had swapped Vin Scully for Ernie Harwell, People in Detroit would be up in arms, and they'd run Vin out of town, <laughs> and they would have run you right down the 405 and out of Los Angeles, wouldn't they? I think the uh, announcer you grow up with is uh, your favorite. Everybody has his favorite, and uh, certainly uh, some announcers are better than others. But the main thing is that uh, you're part of the family, and we get letters, you know, from uh, ladies that say, I'm 55 years old, but when I was a little girl, my grandfather would have the radio on when I was in the car with him and I listened to you and when I hear your voice, it brings back memories of my granddad and usually I say, yeah, you probably wanted to hear that rock music <laughs> that he made you listen to the ball game. And we welcome you to a sunny day in Baltimore, a little bit on the cool side. We had uh, slight rain early in the morning and we are looking forward to American League action. I think that Kurt Smith uh, who is something of an authority on baseball announcers, has written several books on the subject. I think he got this about as well as anybody could regarding you. Uh, let me quote from Kurt Smith. If a baseball broadcaster is good enough, lasts long enough, and is possessed of an easy familiarity, he becomes almost an extended member of the family. He evolves into a friend, into a form larger than some voice of an organized and mercenary team. Throughout broadcasting, no baseball manner has spoken more distinctively of friendship as opposed to stagecraft than that of the lyricist, poet, and historian known as Ernie Harwell. <laughs> well, Kurt Smith's been very good to me, and I appreciate those remarks. And I don't know whether they're true or not, but uh, I, they sound good to me anyway. <laughs> he italicized the word friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, the great local baseball announcers have that quality. But I think that a consensus would be that you had that quality to the greatest extent, that quality of somehow making people feel as if they were your friend, that they were in the presence of a friend. Well, I do feel like those people out there were my friends, and I hope I was their friend, because uh, it, it, it is a unique association that you have with your listener. And uh, I, I really ap appreciate the fact that uh, they take an interest in, in me, and I don't uh, know that I deserve that, but uh, all I try to do is just be myself. I wanted to broadcast the game that I thought would, I would like to hear as a, as a listener, and I tried to give the score as often as I could. That was my main concern. Yes. Four to three, Tigers lead. Here's a pitch. It's a breaking ball in for a strike. Senior Smoke mixing them up now with breaking pitches. And then let the play take over. And of course, you can't just say ball one, strike one. You have to fill in. And usually I did it with the, 
anecdotes or historical information that maybe nobody else uh, came up with and, and just sort of let the chips fall where you may. There are going to be some people that like you and some people that don't like you. And you have to accept that when you start out. Very, very few people don't like you. <laughs> In fact, I, I don't think I've ever come across somebody who said, that's so-and-so, Arnie <laughs> Has anybody ever, through all the years, come up to you and said, I cannot stand you? Oh, I imagine they have, but uh, I'm lucky enough not to hear them too much. <laughs> <laughs> when Bo Schembechler, who of course won great fame as the coach mm -hmm. at Michigan and was beloved throughout the state, uh, became briefly the guy in charge of the Tigers, he fired you, inexplicably right. fired you in 1991. In that moment, did you dislike Bo Schembechler? I think maybe I did, but uh, I accepted it. I knew that uh, everybody could be replaced and nobody will last forever. And if you work for somebody, he certainly got the privilege and the right to fire you. And it was a blow to me, but I think in the long run, it's probably the best thing that happened my, to my career because it brought some undue atten attention toward me and uh, caused a quite a hero around uh, Michigan and, and in Detroit. And uh, I recovered. Mr. Mike Illich bought the team, and within a year I was back uh, broadcasting uh, for the Tigers. And it was something that uh, I had to accept. And uh, once again, I leaned on my faith, and I knew that uh, for some reason this was happening, and it was uh, eventually going to work out for the best. And that's exactly what happened. Bo was a very strong-willed man. Did, yeah. he did he eventually recognize the error of his ways? Did he apologize? Uh, no, he never did, but uh, I forgave him, and, uh, you know, it's in the past. And he was a great football coach. I had a lot of admiration for him, and I never had any problems with him. It just happened that uh, they felt like they were going in, quote, a new direction. And, and nobody could explain that, but it happened. A new direction is sometimes a wrong turn. You, you could get bad directions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you crossed paths with him, if you did after that, was it uncomfortable? Well, here's, here's I, two I, Michigan I, icons. I, we, I remember there, there was a, a dinner at something, and, and I was sitting in the back, and uh, Bo was the speaker. And as he came out, I tried to shake hands with him, and uh, he walked past me. And uh, But those things happened. He just had uh, a certain attitude about it. and. I understood that, and I never really felt uh, uh, close to him, but, uh, and I guess there was a feeling of being uncomfortable if I was with him because of the circumstances. But uh, in the long run, it worked out uh, the best for me. Up next, Ernie Harwell talks about two guys he actually knew, Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. Rubber arm made him one of the greatest to ever take the mound. I threw 227 pitches. Hall of Famer Juan Marichal toes the rubber on Studio 42 <laughs> with Bob Costas. Next Tuesday night at 8, only on MLB Network. Get into the action. MLB Network is expanding the zone, broadcasting high def 24 hours a day. All the action, all the analysis, all the amazing baseball in widescreen HD. MLB Network in HD. It's a whole new ball game. Gentlemen, this is vodka. Some men believe substance is style. Some men refuse to drink their vodka out of delicately painted perfume bottles. Inspired by 300 years of tradition. Kettle One, please drink responsibly. there for you and life's daily miracles who's the best this guy is there for you and your guilty pleasures what was the most surprising championship team of all time who was the greatest clutch hitter? Never was a time that I'm going to try to hit a home run. It's sure going to be today. Or made the most amazing catch. Unbelievable! 
MLB Network's Prime 9, a countdown of baseball's top teams, games, and players. It's a show guaranteed to start arguments, not end them. What do you think I should do? Take him out or leave him in? All right, I'm going to take him in. Prime 9, every Monday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific on MLB Network. The season's over. But the action is just beginning. Three run homer! Now on MLB Network. We'll keep the game alive with all the offseason rumors and trades. Original program, insight from Bob Costas. And classic games you'll never forget. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! If you love baseball, there's only one place where you'll feel right at home. MLB Network, our national pastime all the time. Because April is right around the corner. Welcome back to MLB Network's Studio 42 with Bob Costas. Let's turn the clock all the way back. As a lad, you're a bat boy for the Atlanta Crackers. Sometimes minor league teams would play exhibitions against barnstorming big league teams or the teams be coming north from spring training. When you were the bat boy, did you ever cross paths with big leaguers? Well, yes, they would come up and play like the Yankees would come up and, uh, and play and on their way back or the Detroit Tigers and uh, later on when uh, when I was uh, attending a ball game Babe Ruth uh, came up uh, and uh, played against the uh, Crackers and I got his autograph that's when he signed my shoe he came off the field and I, s I sneaked down to the uh, box seats and it was about the eighth or ninth inning and uh, Babe came in from right field and the dugout was on the uh, third base side and I was right there at the edge of the dugout, and he came in, and I said, Mr. Ruth, Mr. Ruth, uh, please give me your autograph. And he said, well, kid, you ain't got anything for me to sign. I was so stupid, I didn't have a piece of paper. I had a pen, so I put my tennis shoe over the railing, and he signed my shoe. You still have the shoe? I wish I did, <laughs> but I don't. You only had one pair of shoes, probably. Right. You went out and played in them, them, and then... The, yeah, they <laughs> wore out all the time. And that was the end of it. Right. Uh, growing up in Georgia, did you know Ty Cobb? Yes, I knew Ky. I didn't know until I got into uh, baseball, but uh, when I started at the WSB, the uh, second year I was there, 1941, Cobb came down to his hometown in Royston, and I suggested that I go down and interview him, and the, the bosses said, you know, he's not going to talk to you. Don't go down there. And I went down there, and he was just as gracious and warm as he could be, filled up the whole show. I had a 15-minute show. He took the whole show. He couldn't have been nicer. And later on, when I did the Masters, I did the Masters on uh, NBC radio, and uh, he would sit around uh, at Augusta Clubhouse and talk to the, the golfers. And then later on, I saw him at the different uh, uh, old-timers games and things like that. He was always very cordial and warm to me, but I'd heard a lot of horror stories about Tyrus <laughs> Raymond Cobb. So you found Ty Cobb, at least in your personal dealings with him, to be gracious and charming. Mm -hmm. And that's counter to what people now yeah. believe about him. And you know, if you look a lot at, at, at Ty Cobb's letters, most of them are almost literary, and they're well written, and uh, they, they are very comforting, and they're very kind and warm, and uh, he certainly uh, belies the personality that most people think of him as the meanest man who ever played baseball. Could it be because, A, you were a, a kid, B, or relatively a kid, B, you encountered him outside the heat of competition, and you were a fellow Georgian. Maybe you got the best side of Cobb, because I have to believe that a lot of what we've heard is true. Oh, I think a lot of it's true, yeah, but I think I was lucky because I, I did uh, talk to him outside uh, of the competition of baseball, and, and he was very relaxed then, and I think uh, as he got older, he probably craved a little attention like a lot of people do, you know, when they get out of uh, the sport, they, they miss it and, mm -hmm. and uh, they welcome it when it comes along. There was a time, if you took a poll in the middle of the last century, 1950, even though Babe Ruth's career was long over, Cobb, by consensus, at least with the sports writers who held sway then, Cobb was the greatest player in baseball history. Then, as the years went along, and neither of them took any subsequent at-bats, Ruth became the guy. And then other players came along. Cobb died in the early 1960s. My sense is that he died with some bitterness that his standing was slipping. Is that right? I think Ty Cobb always uh, had a feeling about Babe Ruth. Uh, Cobb was uh, the number one player up until the 20s, no question about that. 
and most people thought he was the greatest player that ever lived. When he retired, he had 96 records at that point. A lot of them had been broken. But uh, when Babe came in and he changed the game with a home run, and uh, Cobb was the inside baseball, the strategy, the hit and run, the place hitting and all that kind of stuff. And I think he resented the Babe and, and they, they were pretty good rivals. And by the time he died, I'm sure that uh, his uh, uh, status, uh, Ty's status had slipped and Babe's had uh, gained in recognition and he probably resented that. Somebody said once, I can't remember who, Ty Cobb was the greatest player of the century but it was the 19th century. Yeah. <laughs> and it just continued, essentially, until 1920 when the lively ball came mm -hmm. in. But that made the difference, and Cobb even uh, uh, challenged, uh, you know, Ruth in the home run department one time. He had three home runs in one game to show that he could do it. And, but uh, I think he looked down on that type of baseball because he'd grown up in, in the era where you had the hit and run and the squeeze and all those things. When we continue, Ernie Harwell on his call of Bobby Thompson shot heard round the world. It's gone, and then that was it, and then the crowd took over, and I kept my mouth shut. They are recognized as the best of the best and raise the bar for all others. They wow us with extraordinary talent and possess unrivaled passion. They break records and know how to win. Now, see who achieved greatness as Hot Stove celebrates the 2009 MLB Award winners. Wednesday, the NL and AL Managers of the Year. We pay tribute to the contenders and honor those who rose above the rest. On Hot Stove, Wednesday, 7 Eastern and Pacific on MLB Network. Has anybody ever had skunky beer? Clear and green bottles let in light, which can turn traditionally brewed beers skunky. Brown bottles protect better. Every Samuel Adams comes in a brown bottle, and we use tire six-packs to protect it from the light. We put so much care into brewing the beer that we want to protect it. His was the oldest registered distillery in the United States, from a place where the water was cool, clean, and iron-free, perfect for making whiskey. Charcoal mellow, drop by drop, for smooth sipping the Tennessee way, which is not the easy way, but it was his way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me. For, for giving, giving us. The chance to play. To learn. To, to grow. grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the ability, the skills, the power to grow up and be whatever, anything, everything I want to be. And everything I am today. RBI stands for Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities. But to its thousands of participants across the country, it's so much more than baseball. This is beyond opportunity. This is beyond baseball. MLB Network presents the Plays of the Year. It's the AL's top smashes, crashes, and bashes. Capital One Premier Plays of the Year, American League. Next Tuesday night at 9, only on MLB Network. Welcome back to Studio 42 with Bob Costas and his guest, Ernie Harwell. Eventually, you become the voice of the Atlanta Crackers, and you're a highly regarded minor league announcer. And Red Barber, who is the voice of the Dodgers, takes ill. The Dodgers need an announcer, but it's not quite that simple, is it? Red got sick. Red Barber got sick in Pittsburgh on a trip with the Dodgers, and uh, they sent him to the uh, Presbyterian Hospital, and they thought he was going to die. I didn't know that he'd ever come back. And the Branch Ricky, his boss, contacted the man that owned the Atlanta Crackers, for whom I was working, and he said, I'd like to have Ernie Harwell come up and replace Red. And Earl Mann said, well, Mr. Ricky, that's fine, but um, I've got him under contract, and if you'll do me a big favor, maybe you can have Ernie. You send me your catcher uh, from Montreal, Cliff Dapper, and Ernie can come up and replace Red. So I was traded for minor league catcher. To, that's how I got to the big leagues. So you go to Brooklyn. Red Barber is their voice, their signature voice. You're there for a short time. And then people who associate you with the Tigers for so long may not realize this, but there were some other stops one of which was with the New York Giants. Little known fact, on October 3, 1951, when the Dodgers and Giants played the third game of their best of three pennant playoff at the Polo Grounds and Bobby Thompson hits the home run, 
Everybody has heard Russ Hodgers, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. Maybe they've heard Gordon McClendon on the, uh, the Liberty Network. He had a very melodramatic setup of the game and call of the game. And of course, Red Barber's doing it uh, on the Brooklyn side. But there were actually, I've read, five separate radio broadcasts. I think Harry Carey was there mm -hmm. in some capacity. And there was one television broadcast, one of the very first coast-to-coast -coast television broadcasts. And you were the announcer. But the tape, I guess, or kinescope, does not survive. Oh, well, Russ Hodges and I were the two announcers, and we alternated between radio and TV. And on that particular day, October the 3rd, it turned out that I was going to be on TV, which I thought was, wow, this is a lot better assignment. Poor old Russ with those uh, five radio broadcasts. He was sort of get lost, and I'm on coast to coast and by myself on NBC. It's the first sports series ever telecast coast to coast, and this is a historic moment. And sure enough, it happened, and, and Russ made that great call. And I was on the TV when Thompson hit the home run. I just said it's gone, and Pafco watched it go in the front uh, row of the seats there for the home run that uh, won the pennant. And uh, there was no, no record of my, my voice at all. Uh, people didn't record things in those days. And of course, Russ was recorded, and uh, the sponsor Chesterfield got out a record. It became the most famous sports broadcast of all time. <laughs> And only Mrs. Harwell and I know I was on that <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but you remember that you had a simple, because it was television, yeah, so you was just TV. had to put a mm -hmm. caption beneath the picture, a simple, it's gone. It's gone, and then that was it, and then the crowd took over, and I kept my mouth shut. And uh, of course, nobody can prove that one way or the other because there's no existing tape. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the tape of Red Barber's call yeah. uh, for Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and once he's established that the ball is in the seats, and the Giants have won the pennant. On radio, he's silent with just the crowd roaring for nearly a minute. Delivers, the crowd's one run in front of the deep spot to left field. It is a home run. And the New York Giants win the National League pennant and the total sound goes wild. And McClendon, too, I've heard his uh, tape, and, and that's a little more dramatic and a little more literary, maybe, but also a good job. Bobby. Waiting, Frank the throws. Bobby Sweet makes a long run there on the left. Going, going, going. The Giants win the pennant. It was such a great moment, I think it took care of itself. Very many of the great early sports broadcasters had Southern backgrounds. Yourself, Red Barber, Mel Allen, Lindsey Nelson. It's a very long list. Why do you think that is? The facetious answer was we were too lazy to work for a living. But I think we, most of us uh, grew up in, in sort of a rural atmosphere. Uh, there was not much entertainment. Uh, as a kid, you would listen to your parents talk about Uncle Joe or Aunt Minnie, you know, and what was going on in the neighborhood. And, and the, the people that were around me were great storytellers. They loved to tell jokes, and they loved to uh, tell about other people, and they were interested in people. And I think most all of us, Mel Allen, Red, and all of us uh, sort of inherited that in, in our Southern upbringing. Every November is an opportunity to go the distance. To make history. It's about challenge and passion. And pumpkins. And this year is my year. It's my year. It's my year. You get up, you show up. Day in, day out. There is no defeat. There is no second place. There is no I in pumpkin. Well, actually, there is. Some of us are just born to chunk. I am definitely born to chunk. <laughs> pumpkin Chunkin'. Thanksgiving at 8. Only on Science Channel. 
Welcome back to MLB Network's Studio 42 with Bob Costas. You come out of the South, and obviously there are racial issues. You were the broadcaster, after all, for a team that was called the Atlanta Crackers, and you mm -hmm. think about all that that implies. You get to Brooklyn a year after Jackie Robinson has broken the color barrier. I remember hearing Red Barber say that with his Southern background, he had to take stock when Branch Rickey brought Jackie Robinson in. Not because he felt malice, but because given the customs that he had grown up with, this was something he wasn't at first comfortable with. How about yourself? I'd grown up in the South where uh, the, the custom was a complete separation between the races. But I think uh, what uh, tempered my feeling even before I got to Brooklyn was that when I was in the Marines, I saw that uh, uh, the African Americans were just as good as the white people in whatever they did. So I really had a, a feeling of comfort when I went up there about the racial issue. It didn't bother me at all. It was a little strange because uh, I had uh, I'd never seen a, a black man, you know, play in, uh, against the white competition. But it was there, and uh, I accepted it. And uh, Jackie became a very good friend of mine. And I played cards with him, played golf with him, rode the train with him. And uh, it was the most exciting and most uh, eventful thing, I think, that's happened in sports history, the breaking of the color line by Jackie Robinson and, and Branch Rickey. I've heard you tell a story about an exhibition game between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Atlanta Crackers, and there were threats from the Ku Klux Klan, threats on Jackie Robinson's life if he played at Ponce de Leon Park. In my second year with the Dodgers, 1949, uh, the Dodgers uh, I left Vero Beach and they went to Houston to play, and then they were coming into Atlanta. And uh, the, a fellow named Green, a Doc Green, they called him, the head of the Ku Klux Klan, he called uh, the Atlanta cracker owner, Earl Mann, and said, if Jackie Robinson plays in Ponce de Leon Park, he'll be shot. And uh, Earl Mann called the sheriff right away and told him that. And uh, it didn't bother Earl Mann. He said uh, to the a KKK head, head, he said, go to hell, <laughs> you know, it doesn't bother me. And then I broadcast that uh, series of games, and the Dodgers came in, and uh, <clears throat> with uh, Jackie Robinson, Bert Schotten read the letter that uh, the KKK had written. They had a clubhouse meeting, and uh, in, the, in the process of reading the letter, uh, he had uh, all the players around listening, and uh, Gene Hermansky was sort of the wag, you know, and he said, I, I tell you what, let's do, let's all wear number 42, and they won't know which one Jackie is. <laughs> <laughs> There's always gallows humor no matter, yeah, in, right. in sports, no matter how serious so the issue. So they went out and played the game, and uh, they, uh, they had a good crowd that first night. Prop the uh, ballpark at Ponceland seated about 12,000 people, and uh, the first night they must have had about uh, 17 or 18,000, and then it got bigger. The next day, it got to be about 22. And I think the final day, they drew something like 26,000 people. And it was a great success. Nothing untoward happened at all. And uh, he played, and uh, that was the end of it. How much ugliness, obviously, no shots were fired, but how much ugliness over the years did you see directed at black players? Oh, quite a bit, especially in the, in the early days. Uh, Jackie got the, the brunt of it, of course, when when I was with him in 48, uh, and he had broken in in 47, but there was still a, a great residue of a bitterness and prejudice against him. And uh, he'd go into certain towns and, and it would get pretty bitter. We'd go into a southern town, like uh, almost southern town, like St. Louis or Cincinnati, and have a Sunday doubleheader. They'd pack the ballpark and half the people would be uh, black and half the people would be white. And all, all the uh, African-American folks would be rooting for the Dodgers, and the, uh, the white people would be look, rooting for the Cardinals or Cincinnati or whoever uh, was playing. But it, it was there, and then when we were on the bus with, uh, with the Dodgers in, in 48 and 49, uh, the people would gather around the African-American people, and uh, they re really worshiped Jackie. He was sort of a messiah for them, and all the interest was focused on uh, Jackie Robinson. Did you do recreations of ball games? A lot of the early announcers wouldn't travel to the game. They'd get some sort of telegraph report and recreate the game. Did you do that? When I broke in with the Crackers, uh, everybody did recreations. 
Even in the major leagues, they did recreations up until 1952. I think the Pirates were the last ones to give it up. But uh, when, uh, when the Crackers played in Birmingham, uh, we would have a telegrapher in the press box and one in the studio. I'd be in the radio studio, and the telegrapher would send back a message to our telegrapher, uh, Costas up, uh, uh, S1C, strike one call. And of course, the announcer in the meantime, he fills in everything, you know, Costas is up, but he steps out, he goes for the rosin bag, he wants to uh, uh, wipe his hands off the bat, and the infield's in close, the outfield's around to left, and, and uh, now Jones out on the mound, he looks in to get his sign from Smith, here's a wind up, here's a pitch, curveball on the outside corner, just hit the outside corner, strike one called. And, uh, and then uh, when, when you, let's say Costas grounded out to shortstop, you'd get the uh, out, short to first, that's all you'd get. So you'd have the wind up again, the ball hit, and the shortstop goes deep in the hole, he grabs the ball, long throw to first, got him by a step in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the recreated game sounds like it would be more yeah, exciting and, than and the real game. you had to be a lot better actor than you were an announcer. Where a dog would run on the field, you know, in his imagination, and he'd describe it because the wire would break down from time to time. And you'd foul off 15 pitches, or maybe even have a little rain <laughs> or an argument. And, and the wise would say to the guy when he comes home, what was that argument you had with the so Oh, we didn't have any argument. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you might need a rain shower mm -hmm. uh, on a day that you had previously described as perfectly sunny and beautiful, right? And then all of a sudden, inex unexpectedly, right. in comes the rain. Yeah, it came out of nowhere. <laughs> Still to come, Ernie Harwell on some of the signature phrases that endeared him to Tiger fans. My other one for uh, the call third strike was he, he's out for excessive window shopping. He looked at one too many. <laughs> 1979, Disco Fever flames out. JR fans 313 and Pops and the family make a run to remember. Baseball Seasons 1979, Wednesday, 8 Eastern and Pacific on MLB Network. The World Series may be over, but there's still live championship baseball to be played. And MLB Network's got live coverage. Watch baseball's rising stars go head-to-head -head in the Arizona Fall League Championship game, Saturday at 2.30 Eastern on MLB Network. Gillespie never gives up, even if it's an 0-2 count. The big man taught me to be patient and wait for the right pitch. It's perseverance that's going to make Gillespie a household name. Power calls perseverance. Me, I think it's more of a gift. Major League Baseball supports the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Here, kids learn values like perseverance. I think Howe is a promising player. He just needs a little coaching. Major League Baseball and the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Together, we create a positive place for kids. We will see. is just beginning. A three-run homer! Now on MLB Network. We'll keep the game alive. Let's go! With all the off-season rumors and trades. Original program. Insight from Bob Costas. And classic games you'll never forget. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! If you love baseball, there's only one place where you'll feel right at home. MLB Network, our national pastime all the time. Because April is right around the corner. Welcome back to Studio 42 with Bob Costas and his guest, Ernie Harwell. After a brief stint with the Giants, you spent several years in Baltimore as the first modern voice of the Baltimore Orioles. They'd moved from St. Louis as the Browns became the Orioles in 1954. So you see Brooks Robinson break in, and you have a nice little run there. But it's in 1960, when you get to Detroit, that you find your true baseball home. It's probably the best move I ever made because the people of Michigan have really been super. They're great fans. It's an original franchise. They know their baseball. They have a great passion for it, that and other sports too. And uh, th it goes generation to generation. People that uh, used to come to Briggs Stadium and then Tiger Stadium and then Comerica Park, and they hand it down from generation to generation. Hello. Jimmy McLean is one of the first out of the rugout as 
as the Tigers come from behind and McLean has his 30th victory of the 1968 season. Can you pick out one call that you most enjoy hearing the recording of? One moment either because you liked the job you did or because it captures a moment that's special to you? I think uh, my favorite moment would be uh, between two of the Bobby Thompson home run because it had uh, historical significance. And my other big uh, thrill on a call was uh, Northup's triple when I was on NBC radio with uh, Pee Wee Reese. And uh, it beat Bob Gibson and the Cardinals in the seventh game. Now the set by Gibson, we're ready. There's a swing and a fly ball to center. Here comes Slott digging hard. He almost fell down. It's over his head for the hit. Cash is rounding third. He scores. Willie Horton rounding third. He scores. Northup goes into third base. Detroit leads two to nothing. There's never been any element of shtick about what you do. It was always style, not shtick. But you did have a few phrases that were yours uh, called third strike. Yeah. You, you go ahead. Well, I had two for called third strike. The first one was uh, he stood there like the house by the side of the road and watched it go by. There's a breaking ball in for a strike, and he stood there like the house by the side of the road and watched it go by. Struck him off. And that uh, was derived from an old poem that I recited when I was a tongue-tied kid for declamation contest. And my teacher made us uh, memorize that poem. And my other one for uh, the call third strike was, see, he's out for excessive window shopping. He looked at one too many. <laughs> <laughs> Double play, two for the price of one. Two for the price of one. That was sort of automatic. Most of these things just sort of happened. I didn't contrive any of them, really. Set the pitch, he swings, bounding ball, stopped by Truby for the second one, really the first two for the price of one for the Tigers. A great play by Truby to end the third inning. And my home run call was uh, long gone, but uh, I didn't use that until uh, the mid-'80s. In fact, uh, when Gibson hit his home run at Tiger Stadium against San Diego in the World Series, I wasn't using long gone even at that time. I sort of started saying, there's a long drive, there's a long drive, it's long gone, and, and then I abbreviated it, it's long gone, and then people picked it up and seemed to like it, so I stuck with it. Fielder swings, and there's a fly ball, deep left, might be Hamilton going back, he leaps, and it is long gone, a home run for Fielder, number 37. And here's my favorite, maybe everybody's favorite, who's listened to you through the years, Foul ball into the stands, <laughs> somebody gets the souvenir, and somehow you were able to determine that that fan was from Gross Point or Flint or Saginaw. Well, the foul ball in the stands just happened, too, and I think it, I think it went back to about 1961 when uh, George Kell and I were doing the games, and a ball was hitting the seats, and I just said the fellow from Saginaw caught it or whatever, and then the people began to like that. I say it once or twice more, and... Then I'd walk through the stands and somebody would say, hey, you haven't let a guy from Flint catch one in a long time. Or why don't you let a lady from Windsor catch a foul ball once in a while? I said, okay, so we do it that <laughs> night. <laughs> and it not only made the connection with people in those towns, but made the larger point mm -hmm. that baseball is, is regional. And, and your listeners included people from all those places, and some of them maybe only got to one game a year. Oh, yeah, and then when I went on the road, you know, if I was in New York, it would be Tenafly, New Jersey, or Larchmont, or the Queens, or somewhere like that. If I was in Washington State, it would be Walla Walla. Guy from Walla Walla called it. <laughs> we tried to localize it a little bit. Here's the pitch on the way. He swings and fouls it off. It'll reach the seats. Then the man from Walla Walla will take that one home. Gentlemen, this is vodka. There was a time when standing for something stood for something. When men refused to drink whatever the world just happened to pour in their glass. There was a time when men were men. It was last night. Inspired by 300 years of tradition. Kettle One. Please drink responsibly. 
Congratulations to the New York Yankees on their 27th World Series championship. The Yankees have brought a record-setting championship back to New York. Show your pride with the official shirts and caps the players wore during their clubhouse celebration. Call today for your MLB Authentic Collection World Series Champions t-shirt, cap, and World Series program. Call 877-972-4267 or go online and get the 2009 World Series Champions Clubhouse towel at Yankees.com and order from the entire World Series collection. They are recognized as the best of the best and raise the bar for all others. They wow us with extraordinary talent and possess unrivaled passion. They break records and know how to win. Now, see who achieved greatness as Hot Stove celebrates the 2009 MLB Award winners. Wednesday, the NL and AL Managers of the Year. We pay tribute to the contenders and honor those who rose above the rest. On Hot Stove, Wednesday, 7 Eastern and Pacific on MLB Network. Oh, my goodness. Unbelievable. He made the catch. He is Superman. MLB Network presents the plays of the year. The unbelievable has happened. Next Monday, watch the top slides, drives, and dives from the NL. Oh, what a play. Then, next Tuesday, it's the AL's top smashes, crashes, and bashes. It's gone. Capital One Premier Plays of the Year. Next Monday and Tuesday night at 9, only on MLB Network. Welcome back to MLB Network's Studio 42 with Bob Costas. Something you wrote that a lot of baseball fans are familiar with, and maybe we should wind things up here, uh, because this is the way you concluded your acceptance speech at the Hall of Fame uh, in Cooperstown in, in 1981. This is baseball. What baseball has meant to you and to the country. Can you do it off the top of your head? Uh, the whole thing? Or some portion yeah, of I it. Yeah, I can do the whole thing, I think. Go ahead. Uh, uh, baseball is the president tossing out the first ball of the season and a scrubby schoolboy playing catch on a Mississippi farm. A tall, thin old man waving a scorecard from the corner of his dugout, that's baseball. And so is a big, fat guy with a bulbous nose running home one of his 714 home runs. There's a man in Mobile who remembers that Hannes Wagner hit a triple in Pittsburgh 46 years ago. That's baseball. And so is a scout reporting that a Sandlot pitcher in Cheyenne is a coming Walter Johnson. Baseball is a spirited race of man against man, reflex against reflex, a game of inches. Every skill is measured, every heroic, every failing is seen and cheered or booed and then becomes a statistic. In baseball, democracy shines its clearest. The only race that matters is the race of the bag. The creed is the rule book and color merely something to distinguish one team's uniform from another. Baseball is a rookie, his experience no bigger than the lump in his throat as he begins fulfillment of his dream. And it's a veteran, too, a tired old man of 35, hoping that those aching muscles can pull him through another sweltering August and September. Nicknames are baseball, names like Zeke and Pie and Kai Kai and Home Run and Dizzy and Cracker and whatever. Baseball is the clear, cool eyes of Rogers Hornsby, the flashing spikes of a Ty Cobb, and an overage pixie named Rabbit Miranda. Baseball, just a game, as simple as a ball and bat, and yet as complex as the American spirit it symbolizes. It's a sport, a business, and sometimes almost even religion. Why the fairy tale of William Mays making a brilliant World Series catch and then dashing off to play stickball in the streets with his teenage pals, that's baseball, and so is a husky voice of a doomed Lou Gehrig saying, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. Baseball is cigar smoke, hot roasted peanuts, ladies day, down in front, seventh inning stretch, take me out to the ball game and the star spangled banner. Baseball is a man named Capanella telling the nation's business leaders, you have to be a man to be a big nigga, but you have to have a lot of little boy in you too. This is a game for America, baseball. This is a game for boys and for men. You left just one thing out. What's that? Ernie Harwell's baseball, too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, sir. God Thank bless you, Ernie. You. And I certainly want to thank you from the depth of my heart for your devotion, your support, your loyalty, and your love. Thank you very much. And God bless you.
This 